Come on, boy. Let's go find this kid. It's difficult to put into words the drawing power of Blair Witch, something as familiar as the trails in the forest being twisted into unrecognizable shapes, something backwoods and festering in these quiet northeastern towns, some secrets better left forgotten. Over 20 years later, we still look at the Blair Witch Project as a landmark in film, but now we have a chance to be a part of it with this game. I've never been the most active person, but I've always loved the deep woods in the northeast. West Virginia to Maryland, Blue Mountains to Bluegrass, the calming reassurance of a deep-seated life. Blair Witch does an incredible job at recreating this encompassing environment. I like that the game opens with a few warnings. This game features scenes of combat violence and PTSD, gives away the protagonist's past quickly, but hey, I totally get being up front with that area of awfulness. This game uses binaural sound, so headphones are recommended, is another good one. You really want to get those headphones on to experience the full headache. By the way, this video is going to be a full overview of the story, so if you're planning on playing it, I would suggest doing so before watching. This game is on Xbox Game Pass, which starts at a dollar for a month, so there's no reason to wait. With that being said, let's get to the story. The opening takes you through back roads you would see on the way to a hike and pulls into a search party that's left without you. From here you are taken into the mouth of the woods. One of the first things you do in this game is customize Bullet, your therapy dog. My immediate thought was, oh man, they are totally going to kill this dog. You also receive a phone call on your way to the search party. Without directly saying it, you could tell the woman on the phone and our protagonist are going through some serious trouble. This offhanded introduction to the story is a nice touch. It allows the game to fully develop a personality and backstory for the main character while not creating dissonance for the player controlling them. This background develops once you find the camcorder, beginning a flashback that shows the main character is a veteran and is haunted by PTSD, to the point that it has ruined his relationship and cost him his job as a police officer. The nice fluid storytelling from the beginning loses all of its subtlety in this moment, just dumping the story on the player's head. I especially don't like these flashbacks as they are in direct conflict with the original Blair Witch movie, which uses guerrilla-style narrative to only show what is captured on film in the present moment. On the other hand, I think this blackout session is a good example of the protagonist being an unreliable narrator that is genuinely trying to get better. Even if they aren't the most likable person, you can sympathize with their struggle. We also transition from the bright, inviting opening of the forest to this dark and foreboding wilderness. The tall, bright horizon of trees now mangled and rotten hollow, a place only familiar to those unseen. After the initial blackout session where you find your first real clue, you stumble upon a bleached dead tree with these unnatural vines jutting out of it. When your cop friend Emmett says that they see the tree you mentioned before, there's a sigh of relief in the idea that you'll finally be able to make some human contact. We all know this isn't going to happen, but it does reveal the way the Blair Witch manipulates time and place through the progression of the plot. The video camera is a totem of this time manipulation. By pausing the red tapes, you can manipulate the forest to help your progress. A fallen tree, a locked door, anything that blocks your path is usually fixed in this method. Surprisingly, this function works extremely well and does not hold your hand with how the time shift can help you. Getting to the end of a puzzle where the tape was given to you at the beginning, then realizing you need to change the time again to finally solve the puzzle felt really satisfying. Although by opening the door to time manipulation you're going to gather a lot of plot holes, the interesting effect this has on gameplay more than makes up for it. The shadows of the past are constantly looming over Ellis. 
When you reach this car, which the protagonist even Wait. states how unnaturally Isn't it's it? aged, you receive instructions from a stranger that you oh, probably right. shouldn't listen to. You do anyways, and hop into the truck and turn on the headlights. I really like this part with the radio here. It's straight out of Silent Hill 2. I'm so glad you could join me on this very special night. Do you know what time it is? That's right! It's time for our annual trivia challenge! Today's question is... You get the lights on and the world beams in the morning dew. Not only are we no longer a part of the world we know, we're not even in the present. This combination of not knowing your place or time with the normal episodes of PTSD that distorts the protagonist's perception flows in the smooth and uneasy draw. Some things are better left forgotten, but cannot be. We follow our protagonists as they must face shadows of their time in combat. While not anything I would normally consider to be in the tone of Blair Witch, it works as a legitimately frightening aspect of the game. We first see Ellis as this rough and angry man that seems to mess up his own life out of his inability to control his anger, but in these episodes we begin to sympathize with him. The guilt that lives with him every day, the uncontrollable terror. It's a brave move on the game's part to branch away from the traditional spooky setting to this very real and haunting matter. These episodes lead to the section where the game finally sold me on the atmosphere. Running from the imaginary gunfight and approaching the tethered and gaping tree as the world flashes in searing red shades, powering through the dark and cramped innards, slowly losing more and more room as your flashlight flickers, daring to shut off at any moment, the witch cooing with threatening comfort. You feel like the forest has consumed you, severing your connection with the world you knew and making you one of its own like the rotting trees. The life you once knew was harsh. Horrible memories of shattered relationships are left as you bind your flesh to moss and soil. This is what you deserve. This notion is yanked from us with the aid of bullet, calming and returning us to reality, at least as real as it can possibly be. How did we end up back here? Unfortunately, this spectacular moment is cut short as we reach the midway point. At the halfway point, we reach a section that's directly taken from Half-Life. We see a valley filled with the deadly leaf balls of doom and realize we need to find a safe passage through it. After finding a minecart, we move to a station where the path is blocked and now need to find a way to repair the engine as to remove the obstacle and push the cart forward through the deadly valley. It was a strange feeling of dread, not only because you know you're going to need to solve this multi-part puzzle using the clunky minecart controls, but you will also have to do it in complete darkness. I do like that the game leaves it up to you to study the map and get the parts you need by following the notes that reveal where they've been taken to, but it does bring a few breaks in the ideology. Why doesn't Ellis just take the map with them? Why didn't he take a map in the first place? Why do I need to rewind the tape to reignite the steamed donkey, but still have to find the missing parts? Shouldn't those also return once the video pauses with them clearly on the machine? I know once you open the time floodgates you'll be swimming in questions like this, but the whole part jumps from scary to tedious. Luckily the story and tone pick up from this point into its screeching crescendo. You finally find the man from the first recordings named Carver and see that he is friendly with Bullet, playing out like a dark reflection of yourself. He takes you to this foggy section that nails the atmosphere. This area is one of the highlights of the game. The environment perfectly melts into this foreign valley with these awful red silhouettes in your camera view. The goal is always right in front of you, but you have to keep your eyes all around you just in case one of these nightmares are closing in. Carver begins his constant beratement-filled instructions, and you start to get the idea that you truly have no control over the situation, held down and forced into your own decay with little resistance. The tangled webs the witch weaves shows its exposure on Carver's face and mind, a terrible premonition of our own fate. Our instructions lead us to the worst-case scenario, as we are told we need to kill Bullet to save the kid. Ellis reflects on what I imagine everyone's sentiment by completely refusing. In doing so, Bullet runs off and is caught in a bear trap. 
we scoop him up and immediately look for a solution, anything at all. The rocky outcrops close in and begin swaying loops over and over with more etchings manifesting, hammering in the fact that this is not a negotiation. This scene is brutal. Your vision fills with a nasty haze and a faint ringing growing louder and louder. We are matched in our disbelief and sorrow with this impossible circumstance. Our one tether to reality is now on a sacrificial stone, and we are made to imbue the horrifying incantation. We black out, and when we come to, Bullet is nowhere to be seen. Bullet? We've lost everything, and now must face the final trial, the original house from the first movie. You know this is going to be your final resting place, but the only reason you came here was to save that kid, and when you have nothing, you have nothing to lose. I would have been let down if the house wasn't in the game somewhere, and this part does not disappoint. Blooper Team is right in their zone with these tight corridors and changing environments like we've seen in Layers of Fear, and the layout is perfectly terrifying. Every element we have faced up until this point is reiterated to the maximum degree as we painfully loop backwards like in PT while the claustrophobic decay soaks the surroundings like it's running down the back of your shirt. The witch will warp time to give this false sense of security and then rip it away as if to force Ellis to face what unreal reality's grip he's in. Not even Carver can offer a reassuring put-down in this climax. The house is its own separate universe that is cracked and folded upon itself. After what feels like hours of torment, we finally reach a snapping point. The witch's symbol on our camera flares. Everything we get in contact with is destroyed by an otherworldly force. Visions of the people we've cared about dissolve in our frustration. For one greedy moment, we feel like we have control over our situation and can finally retaliate, not only against the witch, but against the entire nightmare of the life we've lived. This rampage leads us to the basement. We have our final flashback, the very root of Ellis and his haunting past. The soldier, the cop, the husband, everything that has fragmented his reality to the point of what we see now. We reach our final confrontation with Carver and silence him with a knife to the throat. As we look into our damp reflection, we now see that we have become Carver. Bullet is alive, but he no longer recognizes us. We then see a white on black text conclusion that basically says we failed at everything. Great. Turns out you need to play the entire game again, only this time you cannot interact with the witch's totems or mind blast the figments in the corners during the ending flare. Yeah. Nah. After looking it up, it turns out the good ending is Ellis challenging Carver about being a pawn to the witch and Carver killing us out of frustration. It's incredibly annoying whenever a game decides that we played incorrectly and now we need to play the entire unchanged campaign once again, but this time do something arbitrary that no first-time player would have been able to figure out. Don't make me weigh the pros and cons of going through your story all over again, because most of the time you're not going to win that debate. I don't think they could have made a game that could stay totally true to the original world of the movie, but what they did add works despite the original simplicity. We learn to understand Ellis and his downfall. The PTSD is a strong motivator in the shock and horror that Ellis brought with them to the forest and plays wonderfully with the creepy atmosphere. While I'm not a fan of the flashbacks and constant hints at the full memory's revelation, it paints a fully realized character and doing so we grow more invested than we would have with the piecemeal character building in the original. The main issue with the story is in its pacing. The slow crawl from the opening works to set the atmosphere, but truly takes too long to get started and leans on the side of boring. The climax has the exact opposite problem where it feels like it's throwing way too much at you all at once. At times it feels like the story was built in five different parts, all designed by different people. But what works about this game really works. The setting feels real and the lighting is nothing short of fantastic, especially when transitioning between different exposures of time. I caught myself pausing just to admire the landscape and its blissful breaks from the action. 
and the long treks between waypoints, it's easy to get lost in the foliage in a wonderful way. Blair Witch is uneven, and the conclusion is a major letdown in my opinion, but overall, I can't say it's a bad experience. More half-baked and fleeting like the victims of the witch. If you can overlook these flaws, I would recommend this game. It's one of those situations where actually playing the story does so much more than just watching it. That is, if you can withstand the witch's call. <laughs>